Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Something is Killing the Children, number one from Boom Studios. I loved it this book. I thought it was awesome. It really, really was very effective. I adore this comic book. It's written by James Tiny IV, artwork by Werther Della Dera, and coloring by Miguel Muerto. Muerto. Fantastic, fantastic book. I really, really like this one. It's a horror comic book, and it's about a town in which a bunch of kids have gone missing, and some have wound up being found killed, murdered, torn apart. Is there some kind of creature or monster or something loose in this city? Does this happen in other cities? Is, are there hunters, maybe, that kind of go after these type of creatures? Those are questions that start getting answered in the first issue of this exceptional comic book. I absolutely loved it. The artwork is incredibly moody and atmospheric. It's got a great, sketchy, gritty, loose-type style. And then the coloring. The coloring is absolutely fantastic, really adding to this level of this, this bleak atmosphere, right? And when the colors amp up, the book itself amps up with tension, with horror, just with great, great thrills. I loved this book so much. Interesting, engaging characters, a compelling mystery, and it's just a very effective horror comic book. I really did love this one. If you like scary books, if you're getting ready for Halloween, stuff like that, you want something new, something different to check out, check out Something That's Killing the Children, number one, out this week from Boom Studios. I loved this comic book so much. Pick of the week. Eerie, um, spooky, um, atmospheric, an excellent sense of pacing, great dialogue. James Tynion writes great dialogue, and this is some of the best dialogue I have read from him in his career so far. I really love this one. I think it's top-notch top -notch work from all involved. Highly recommend that you check it out. Something is Killing the Children, number one, out this week. Also out this week, Doomsday Clock number 11, dare I say it, the penultimate issue of Doomsday Clock is here, finally. It just means one issue left. So how does issue 11 stack up, and is it worth the wait? Well, this one feels less worth the wait than all the previous issues have. Maybe it's because the delays keep getting longer. My, I myself don't really mind the delays so much, but I am very eager to read the conclusion of this book. But what this one is, is this one takes all the different pieces that have already been very meticulously placed where they're supposed to be, and it puts them in their final spot for the final act, the final issue of Doomsday Clock. And that's next. And it's probably not coming out till December, January, February, something like that. Gary Frank pumping out amazing artwork. Jeff Johns pumping out a very intricate, detailed script. Um, that works on so many more layers than typical uh, Jeff Johns stuff does. Did I say Grant Morrison earlier? Jeff Johns writes this book. Anyway, Jeff Johns doing uh, work on layers that he typically doesn't do with his writing. The artwork is fantastic. It's very meticulous. It's clean. I know that this book has been delayed, but if we keep getting high quality content like this, I'm totally set. Anyway, tensions rise and it's all reaching to its final conclusion. And I'm very excited to see what's going to happen in the final issue of Doomsday Clock, whenever number 12 decides to come out. The Legion of Superheroes are back with Millennium number one. It's the first part of a two-issue miniseries written by Brian Michael Bendis with a whole bunch of different artists. we got Jim Lee, Dustin Wynn, Andrea Sorrentino, Andre Lima Arahu. A fantastic artist doing decent, fantastic uh, job in the book. Um, the Arahu bits at the very end are my favorite. I love his artwork so much. Um, the story-wise, though... I've never really been that excited about the Legion of Superheroes. I've heard some runs to check out. All I've really read, I've read bits here and there, but the only thing I've read that I really kind of liked was the Great Darkness Saga. That's mostly because I like the dark side stuff. But Legion's never really appealed to me, so I'm looking forward to seeing what Bendis is going to be doing. But it seems to all of a sudden just be happening all of a sudden, right? And that's something that Bendis is doing with his writing. Like, all of a sudden these things just happen. Like, Event Leviathan just happened. And yeah... It was built up into, it was led into just a little bit, but it kind of get get blindsided by this stuff sometimes when Bendis is on a book. The Legion of Superheroes just feels kind of rushed and thrown together. However, I will say this, this book isn't the Legion of Superheroes. This book isn't the Legion of Superheroes. It's all set up. It's all set up for issue number two. So it's kind of a weak first issue for that. So if people see this, they're getting excited. Hey, I want to check out the Legion of Superheroes. I want to get into it. They pick this up. They're going to read it. 
they're going to be disappointed. Absolutely. Um, the artwork is great in most parts of this book, but the story didn't do anything for me. I don't know. We shall see. Because this is all just set up for the eventual Legion of Superheroes book, which starts in like, what, November, December, something like that? I don't know. It was kind of underwhelming for me, at least. Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, number one. So I typically don't read Harley Quinn books, especially Harley. I just, it was just the Harley Quinn's not really, I don't know. I find that character to be quite annoying sometimes. Uh, this was a very well done comic book. It really was. Directly following some of the events uh, in Heroes in Crisis, so it deals with the aftermath of Poison Ivy's death burial and resurrection, um, rebirth, if you will. Um, her relationship with Harley, that's very cute and it's very well handled in here. Everything, it works. Everything works in this book and it was very much a shock to me because one of the reasons why I don't like Harley Quinn is because it's very Deadpoolized sometimes, meaning it's just a little too much over the top. It's a little just like it's trying too hard to be too edgy and funny and weird and wild and wacky or something like that. Um, this book didn't have that feel. It felt very connected to the DC universe. Um, an, an excellent use of classic DC villains. Um, the relationship between Harley and Ivy really works. The artwork's pretty solid throughout it. I, I liked it. It's a six-issue miniseries, Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, out this week. It's a Harley book that I liked. Jody Hauser was the, uh, the writer on that, so congratulations, Jody. Um, Justice League is out this week with issue number 31. Didn't we just have issue number 30? So the Justice Doom War is finally here. Um, everything that Scott Snyder, James Tiny, and Jorge Jimenez and company have been building up to um, and it's exploded, right? And the last issue was a big, like, bunch of exposition and then just BAM, right? This issue was awesome. I loved it. So you got the team. I love these kind of stories. The teams are split up. They each got their goal. They're going to different time zones. The JSA is involved. Commandy's involved. There's more surprises that are involved. The end of this issue really excites me. Um, I'm loving everything that Snyder and company have been doing with Justice League. That's no surprise if you follow the channel. Issue number 31 was amazing. You got that dynamic artwork by Jorge um, Jimenez. You got that amazing, brilliant coloring by Alejandro Sanchez. Or is it Alexander? It's Alejandro Sanchez. Um, the script by Tinian and Snyder. It works. It's big. It's epic. It's crazy. It's wild. It's cosmic. And this book has never let up of the accelerator since it started. And it just feels like, it feels like we've gotten here fast. But it's because they've never slowed down. They've never stopped. There was like one issue where it slowed down, where like they're rebuilding the moon or something like that, right? That was it. Every other issue, even the, the exposition heavy ones, have been balls to the wall, full steam ahead, building up to this point and what's coming beyond. I'm excited. I love the use of the forger. I love the anti-monitor and the monitor, all the allusions to crisis, all the allusions to hyper time, the past, the Justice Society, of course. That's the big deal right here. Man, this book is a superhero Robbie fanboy's dream come true, Justice League. Number 31 out this week. I adore that comic book. Green Lantern, the Green Lantern. Number 11 is out. This is the penultimate issue of season one of Grant Morrison's Green Lantern. Um, this book has been kind of waning just a little bit in interest. The stories don't feel to have quite the richness or the depth sometimes what we're used to from Morrison. Sometimes he gives us this kind of like stripped down version of his work. This almost feels like that, but I definitely can't wait till I reread it because I kind of felt like that about the first few issues. But then when I reread those, they really kind of came together with a with a more Morrison-esque cohesion, right? As far as coherent as that can be, right? I love Grant Morrison. I'm always down for the ride. Um, the Green Lantern number 11 is kind of the wrap up and the continuation of that Green Lanterns of different realities, multiversal type stuff. That's something that I love when Morrison does in the DC universe. Um, I like it. Liam Sharp pumping out some great artwork. The thing that's really excites me, the thing that really excites me about the Green Lantern by Morrison and Sharp and Olaf is the youthful enthusiasm and energy with which they approach it. This feels like young Morrison. This feels like young Sharp. Of course, albeit a more refined version of, of their talents, right? But really liking Green Lantern right now. Like I said, it's been waning a little bit. That's more because of the expectations of wanting something really deep that's going to reach down in my soul and change my life. It's Green Lantern comic book. It's cop drama in space. And it is weird and it is wild. It feels, it feels like early... It feels like 80s, early 90s, like British comic books. And it just, it works and it works so well. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Anyway, The Green Lantern, number 11. Out this week, I'm um, building up to something real big happening. Lois Lane, number three. So the first two issues I thought were pretty decent. I really think Greg Rucka, the writer, has a great knack for dialogue, a great sense of dramatic pacing and building up tension 
even in a story about a journalist, right? Um, and they're doing a great job with the character of Lois Lane. I love the the inter reintroduction of her name on Toya's question. Um, that really just makes me happy. Um, but issue three, at this point, I'm realizing that this book hasn't completely sunk its teeth into me yet. It hasn't completely hooked me in. Um, yeah, there's this stuff going on. Who's killing Lois? And I like the I like the conversation she has with Superman in this issue. Um, but like, there's some moments that are great and you know, well executed moments. But overall, the series just to me hasn't. I, I feel like it almost had like it hasn't. Maybe it's found its voice. But that voice isn't resonating with me right now. There's nothing hooking me in. There's nothing that's keeping me excited about this book. I like the characterization of Lois. I like the fact that she has her own book. I like the dark, noirish take on the artwork. Um, I love the dialogue. I love the characters that are in it. I just, there's nothing about the overall, th what this book is, that's, that's hitting me right now. And by issue three, I really hope that would cement. So... We'll see what happened. There's only 12 issues in the series, but right now I'm, I'm loving Jimmy Olsen so much more. It's already established its identity and it's hooking me, like, within two issues. I'm still waiting on Lois Lane to kind of do that. I'm still coming around the bend, though. I don't hate it. I don't think it's bad. I think it's good, but nothing's really, like, you know, like, I can't wait to read the next issue of Lois Lane. Doom Patrol, however, I always feel that way. Doom Patrol, Weight of the Worlds, number three, is out this week. This time, Jeremy Lambert and Gerard Way. <laughs> that was a weird way to say his name. My mouth doesn't work all the time. Um, anyway, um, Steve Orlando joined them as a co-writer in this issue. This illustrated by Doc um, Shainer. And the Ill it's just such a beautiful comic book. I love his clean, crisp, classic style. Um, it really fits. It's very rigid in its structure and its grids, but it works. It's a great, it's a really crazy, bonkers, wild, weird Doom Patrol story. That's what you're used to. It's kind of set in the future and it's kind of told as if it's an issue of Doom Patrol or a reprint of the Doom Patrol issue from the future. That may sound confusing, but it's not when you read it. This book is very fun. I'm loving this kind of step down from the wild overarching story and it's just to tell some fun tight little weird Doom Patrol stories. I like that's, that that is what they're doing in this new volume, Weight of the Worlds. Way, Lambert, Orlando, and company doing a fantastic job. I loved issue number three. Issue two was supremely awesome. Issue three maybe a step down only because it's leading into something and we have yet to see exactly what that's going to be. But Doom Patrol, Weight of the Worlds, number three, continues to be weird, wild, DC young animal fun. Deceased. A good day to die. It's a one shot that takes place in the during the story that is Deceased, written by Tom Taylor, who I think is going to be the next Batman writer. We shall see if that actually happens. But he's doing a great job with Deceased. Um, I'm not going to compare it to Marvel Zombies this time. In fact, maybe next time I won't even mention it. Um, but I'm loving what they're doing right now. It's not really so much zombies attacking the DC Universe or anything like that, but it's a whole lot more about just the tragedy of it, the loss of the heroism, the loss of that hope and optimism. And I really think that Tom Taylor's been doing a great job with the series. Something fun, Elseworlds, totally bleak, desolate, just no hope, right? Love that story. Love that kind of stuff. I love that it's centered around apocalypse, of course, and the anti-life equation. So this issue is a kind of like a story that's told that is about Big Barda and it's about Mr. Miracle and Tom Taylor does a lot of throwbacks and a lot of homages to Mitch Garrett's and Tom King's Mr. Miracle run, which just recently wrapped up, which I thought was super, super cool. Um, but the issue deals with them, Mr. Terrific, John Constantine's in there, um, taking the idea of what's going on in this world and approaching it from another perspective that's happening during the main story. Interesting, it's great. If you're loving Deceased, no reason why you shouldn't love this. It's a nice, fun one-shot. You don't have to read it, but maybe they set up some stuff that's going to come into play in future, future issues of Deceased. Right? Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, number 5, the penultimate issue of this third volume series, written by James Tinian, artwork by Freddie Williams II. I love this book. It's been so much fun. Um, Batman TMNT, all these miniseries have been fun. And Tiny has done a great job with the voices of the characters. The artwork by Williams is absolutely fantastic. He knows those likenesses. The coloring is amazing. The, the, the depth of it, the dimension of it, so much fun, right? The third, like, what are you going to do to top books one and two, right? Book three is Crisis in a Half Shell. You bring in all the Crisis on Infinite Earths, all the multiverse type stuff. You bring all that craziness, the original Turtles back, and yes, they're drawn by Eastman in that black and white. Oh my goodness, I love this book. It works so much. It's so fun. It's so wild. It's so just out there and great. And it's a great escalation for the third volume of Batman TMNT. I love it. DC's been getting in on the facsimile editions Lately, they released one this week, Batman 181. What happens in Batman 181? Well, it's the first appearance, arguably so, of the, 
The Incredible Wolverine. Just kidding. It's the first appearance of Poison Ivy. It's a facsimile edition. So if you've never read that, there you go. You get to check it out for the first time. Let's jump over to Marvel. House of X number four is here. Wow. Wow. What Hickman's been doing in the X-Men is something spectacular. Right now, every week in comic shops, they're flying off shelves. People are coming back that have been out of the game for a while, setting up subscription boxes, getting ready, getting excited. Everybody meeting every week, talking about their latest theories, what they think is happening. Why is this character doing this? Loving the artwork, dynamic, full, explosive. Hickman's been building, the, rebuilding the world of the X-Men. And now it's almost as if he wants to tear it apart because there's something more even coming. A new Dawn, Dawn of X, all that stuff, right? This book's been so cool, so awesome, so wild, and everybody's got their theories, everybody's got their ideas, but it doesn't matter. That's the excitement of it. But when you read the book, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to come. And that's what I love about what Hickman's doing with the X-Men right now. This book, whoa, whoa, wasn't ready for this one. Loved it. Loved it. The most action-packed issue yet. Seriously. This doesn't have a bunch of info dumps. It's got some of that, but it does it to maximum effect. The ending of this book is very powerful. Um, House of X number four is wild. I love it. I love this book. I love this series, Powers of Ten, House of X. I'm so pumped for the future of the X-Men right now with Hickman. I love it. I'm so beyond sold. I'm so beyond sold. So beyond sold. Web of Black Widow starts a new miniseries focusing on Black Widow. She does have a movie coming out in May, so you might as well put out a miniseries right now so you have a new trade paperback available when the movie comes out. Then you can launch a new number one because this is just a miniseries, right? It's written by Jody Hauser, who's made me enjoy a Harley Quinn book this week, but the Black Widow book was just okay. I thought it was decent. Stephen Mooney was very excited. He did an image book, red something, cold red, dead red hand, what something. <sighs> I don't remember what that book was called, but I loved his artwork. Knowing that he was going to be doing a Black Widow book, a spy book, I was like, this is perfect for him. Ah, the artwork's all right. It feels a little rushed. It doesn't feel as clean or as pristine as some of his work that I've seen in the past. The story is okay. It didn't do anything new with the character. It didn't really enthrall me. It didn't really entice me to want to come back. It just, I don't know. I don't know. It just didn't really do much for me. But Web of Black Widow number one is out this week. We got a couple absolute carnage tie-ins, starting with Symbiote Spider-Man. This is a one-shot. It's written by Peter David, um, and I love this one-shot. Why? Well, first of all, these absolute carnage miniseries and tie-ins, they've been really fun. They've really been taking this, the horror idea of the series, of the idea that Cates and Stegman have built up, making Carnage such a, a horrifying villain, right? And what's going on? And Symbiote Spider-Man joins in on the fun. It's fun. It's a tragic story about this dude. It's so way back in the day. Spectacular Spider-Man 99, 100, when the symbiote suit first escapes from the Fantastic Four's headquarters and is trying to make its way back to Parker, it randomly takes over this dude for just a little bit. And the dude's like, ooh, I must have blacked out, right? This tells that dude's life story. And it's awesome. And it's so much fun. And it does get tied in to absolute carnage towards the end. But just the idea of what they did, how they just took this random character, because if you're going to go after every character who's ever worn a symbiote, somebody did their, their work and they found every single one because... Who would have remembered this random dude, right? In case you forgot, they reprint those two pages at the very beginning of the issue. I loved it. I thought it was great. Doesn't really necessarily super tie into the, the Symbiote Spider-Man miniseries that Peter David did that just recently um, wrapped up, but it is totally right. If you're loving the Absolute Carnage tie-ins, no reason you're not going to like that. As well as Scream number two. Loved Scream number two. You know, they found Sandoval on, they put Gerardo Sandoval on a book that I really, really like him on. But Colin Bunn does a great job with the character. This book is fun. It's huge. It's explosive. I love any symbiote character. Back when Venom Lethal Protector first came out, we first met Scream and Riot and Phage and Agony and, and Lasher, all those other Life Foundation symbiotes. I just ate it all up. I love the designs. I love the colors. I'm loving this book. I love it so much. Of course, now we know that there's going to be an ongoing Scream book coming out after Absolute Carnage. So this is where it's all building up to. Who's going to wind up the final host of Scream? I don't know. We shall see. They probably already let us know, and I probably just don't remember. However, Scream number two, very fun. Immortal Hulk number 23 is out this week. Um, this issue is fun. Big bra, big, big, all these, all this scary tension has been building up in Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk. Joe Bennett's been pumping out some great artwork, and seriously, the last page of this issue is some of the best horrifying artwork Immortal Hulk has seen yet, and we have seen a lot. 
We've seen a lot. Joe Bennett pumping out career best level work. Um, but all these different factions, they've all been building up to a head. And this is just a big, fun comic book explosion with a tinge of horror. And then it just erupts into horror at the end. What more can I say about Immortal Hulk? This book's already been heating up. People are loving it. It's selling probably higher than almost any Hulk book has in recent memory. It's going to be on everybody's top three, top five list of best Hulk runs of all time depending on how it all concludes, of course. But I'm loving all the crazy, weird, sci-fi, wacky, 50s, EC, horror-worn, publishing-inspired type directions that they're taking this book in. I love it. Immortal Hulk 23 out this week. Amazing Spider-Man going big. It's a one-shot. So to celebrate 80 years at Marvel, um, they're doing these one-shots, bringing back some old-school creators. This one has a story by Jerry Conway, uh, written, uh, illustrated by Mark Bagley. It's also got a story in there by Eric Larson. I'm not a biggest, I'm not a huge Eric Larson fan, um, but the artwork was kind of cool and neat for what he did. The Bagley story with Conway was actually pretty neat and nifty, but unless you're just a super hardcore Spidey fan, there's no reason to pick this up. There's nothing new there. But if you really are a Larson fan, a Bagley fan, or just a hardcore Spidey fan, and uh, yeah, it references some fun stuff from Conway's run. It's pretty interesting, I guess. And speaking of facsimiles, we talked about them earlier. Spider-Woman number one gets a facsimile edition this week. Another 80th anniversary one-shot special, Alpha Flight True North. This is going to be three different stories about different members of Alpha Flight. If you're not an Alpha Flight fan, I would go ahead and skip this one. It's not going to do anything for you. It's not going to get you super interested in the team or set up anything for the future or anything like that. Um, if you're an old-school Alpha Flight fan and you're really upset that you don't get many Alpha Flight books, though Puck is in Immortal Hulk, um, check it out. It'd be fun, right? Absolutely. Fantastic Four number 14 is here. Of course, those immortal variants are out this week. And Fantastic Four has four of them. The Four and Doom. And they look wild and wacky and super cool. If you're interested in the immortal variants, let me know in the comments down below what your favorites of the week are. I want to know. Fantastic Four number 14 starting a new story called Point of Origin. Basic idea behind this is that Reed gets inspired to go on the original journey that created the Fantastic Four because they never actually got to fulfill their mission because, of course, they get hit by cosmic radiation, fell back to Earth, and became the Fantastic Four. Um, I'm loving it. Dan Slott's really kind of ironed out all the kinks. This book feels classic. It feels like Fantastic Four. It's fun. It's got that family orientation, oriented story in there. That's a weird way to say that. Paco Medina's uh, pencils are really fun. Um, they keep that bouncy, fun, vibrant nature of the book alive. I'm loving it. I'm loving this story. I love how classic it feels. Um, Fantastic Four. <laughs> Just so glad it's back. Not only is it back, Future Foundation's back. Issue number two. How can the maker be in the pages of Venom and Absolute Carnage and in Future Foundation? All of that is explained here by writer Jeremy Whitley. Really liking this book. It's fun. It is a little verbose. Gets a little wordy at times. Maybe a little bit too much so. Kind of flows the slows down the flow of the book just a little bit. But the characters are safe in Whitley's hands. Especially Bentley. I love him so much. Um, if you're a Power Pack fan, you definitely want to check this out. If you're a fan of the FF from back in the day, the Hickman days and beyond, you're definitely going to want to check this out. I'm enjoying it. It's fun um, in that classic, fun Marvel manner. Future Foundation number two out this week. F Punisher number 15. The penultimate issue of Matthew Rosenberg's run on Punisher. It's all coming to a head. His battle with Hydra, his battle with Zemo. Of course, Zemo has re-enlisted the Thunderbolts, so Frank gets his own team. And look at my boy there. There's Night Thrasher. Interesting that Night Thrasher's in his old school costume here when he's in his new school costume in Marvel 1000, which just came out last week. What's, what's going to be Dwayne's costume? I just want to know. just want to know. Anyway, um, not a whole lot of Moon Knight, Ghost Rider, uh, Moon, uh, Black Widow, and uh, Night Thrasher action in here. But it's, it's, it's in there, and it's enough to satisfy a, a to scratch an itch that hasn't been scratched in a while. Of course, big things are coming on play for Ghost Rider. And if Marvel 1000 has anything to say about it, so does Night Thrasher. And of course, Moon Knight's getting a TV series. He's going to get a new series, right? Um, anyway, Punisher building up to this big inevitable end, this big final climate, climatic battle between Zemo and Punisher, and that's all going to be in the final issue. But the lead-up to it was pretty fun. I've been enjoying what Rosenberg's been doing with the book. Um, but it doesn't seem like he takes some of these secondary characters super seriously. But this is a Frank book. That's what he's focusing on. I'm just glad Night Thrasher's in another comic book. That's two weeks in a row with the Night Thrasher book. Conan the Barbarian number nine is here, continuing Jason Aaron's one-shot stories, all telling one big story that's the life and death of Conan. And we're building up to it, building up to the conclusion. We got three issues left in the story. Um, I'm loving it, though. Each issue stands on its own feet. It's got decent artwork, great coloring. Um, and Jason Aaron really knows his lore. He throws it all in there. If you're a fan of classic Conan stuff, I think you're going to really like some of the Easter eggs and little homages and stuff that are in this issue. But Conan number nine, 
still does not disappoint. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Dark Temple. What do you, what do you want to call this book? Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Dark Temple. That's so crazy. Well, apparently, Fallen Order Jedi, Jedi Fallen Order is a video game. I didn't know that. If I knew that this was based on a video game before I read it, I probably wouldn't have read it. But I'm glad I read it. It's a neat little part of Star Wars lore. Some Jedis that I never knew about before. I don't know if they've ever existed before this game or this book. I don't know. But it's an interesting story. It's written by Matthew Rosenberg. It's got decent artwork. It's all right. It's pretty decent. But I don't know, it didn't really make me want to come back. But I really applaud them for the name. Star Wars, Jedi, Fallen Order, Dark Temple. They're not really narrowing down on that. <laughs> Let's go into some of the indie small press books. First, I want to spotlight Going to the Chapel from Action Lab Danger Zone. Um, this is written by David Popose, who is the writer um, of Spencer and Locke, which is a fantastic book. If you've never read it, you really need to. Um, is it Gavin Guidry? Gavin Guidry doing the... Artwork, yes. Colors by Elizabeth Kramer. Lettering by Ariana Mayer. This book is really good. This is like top two books of the year. I mean, of the week. Um, I Love Something is Killing the Children. Right below it, Going to the Chapel. This is kind of like Die Hard at a Wedding. It's like if Quentin Tarantino directed or wrote a romantic comedy. I guess in his own way, he wrote a romantic comedy with true romance. I guess to him, that's considered a romantic comedy. Anyway, Going to the Chapel is awesome. A couple months ago, I did an advanced review of this. I got to meet David at a con. I got an early copy of it. Um, the book is great. It really has great, nice, clean artwork. It's got a great pace to it. Excellent dialogue. Um, the coloring is amazing. Um, it really has, it builds this world, this, 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 this concept, um, this situation so perfectly, so pristinely, so efficiently, and it just really starts hitting the ball running. But basically what it's about, it's about this woman who is the daughter of an incredibly wealthy man. She's having a wedding and she's got this like $250 million necklace that she's, wed that she's wearing for the wedding that's on loan. And of course, the dead Elvis gang decides that they're going to go and hijack this wedding. And then, of course, it goes wrong and it becomes a hostage situation. It's die hard at a wedding. And it's awesome. It's so much fun. I really liked it. It's kind of like Wedding Crashers meets Die Hard. Just a little bit. Going to the chapel, number one, is out this week. If your shop doesn't have it, tell them that you want it. Tell them that you want it. It's a fantastic book. Another fantastic book this week from Aftershock is Midnight Vista, number one. This is written by Elliot Ray Hall with Clara Meath on the artwork. Loved this book. It's great. Elliot Ray Hall is telling a story that's very personal to him about that's kind of somewhat inspired by a real life experience in his own life. So this is the story about a kid and his stepfather who get abducted by aliens. And then years later, the kid shows back up. If you've ever read the Joshua Williamson comic book Birthright, which has a new issue out this week, which is great. It's kind of like that, but instead of the fantasy setting, he gets abducted by aliens. And it really feels... I've been thinking about aliens a lot lately, and this is just the way that the synchronicity is working. This book comes out this week. This weekend, we're filming our Aliens podcast, in which we're talking about the Aliens movie franchise and movies about aliens. By the way, let me know in the comments below, what are your favorite movies about aliens? And you might get a shout out on the show. But I'm also just talking about the popular interest in aliens and how it rises and falls. And, and lately, I've been watching a lot of alien-themed shows and movies and getting ready for this podcast and reading this book. And, and just last week, there was a, a version of this story in his cult classic, Return to Whisperer 2 and 3 double feature. Um, and I'm really fascinated by it, and I really like the book. I love the artwork, too. Um, it's a great book. It's very colorful. It tells the story very efficiently. It sets up the mystery. Um, I love it. I thought it was great. Midnight Vista, number one. But there's something leading me to thinking about all this alien stuff. What's it all about? What's it all about? Oh, here's a big one. Spawn 300 is out this week. So, I don't read Spawn. I haven't read Spawn since, like, issue 10 or something like that, right? But it is 300, and I know that a lot of people have been asking lately, um, why don't you read Spawn? Well, I just, I just never really liked Spawn that much. I liked it for a brief moment when I was a kid. But like I said, I got out of it, and I never returned. Um, and then for a while, they actually kind of detested Spawn. Now, I don't really feel my life with hate like that or nothing anymore. So I'm indifferent to Spawn. But I've been hearing good things, and it's 300, so sure, let me check it out, right? Because any good milestone issue should be a good comic book that anybody can jump into and check out, right? Um, so the main story, the first story in here, because there's a few different stories, and Capullo's artwork is amazing, McFarlane's on some bit, J. J. Scott Campbell's on one bit, Jason Alexander, I think, is the other dude's name, yeah, um, 
So the first story was actually pretty decent. You know, it's, it's a little stagnant in its dialogue sometimes. Todd McFarlane's strong suit is not dialogue, I would say. Um, but it did kind of remind me of those classic days back when I was like you know, like 11 or 12 reading Spawn comics. Like, I don't know, it kind of recaptured that feel just a little bit. And I really did like the first initial story and it was interesting and it takes the book into a new direction, I, pres I, I assume, because <laughs> um, I haven't been reading it. But then all the rest of the stories were very confusing to me and I felt just kind of thrown into the middle of just a bunch of wackiness. Um, so that was interesting. But it was an interesting experiment, was just reading a random Spawn comic, albeit issue number 300. But I did like the first story. Seriously. I really did like it. And like I said, it feels classic. And you still got the time, the timer and all that stuff. And I don't know what's been going on to, on Spawn for like 290 issues. But uh, maybe I should retread it and revisit. I don't know. That'd be a fun little side project. Read like an issue of Spawn a week or something like that. I don't know. Spawn 300, though. It's, it's not bad. And I'm sure it's something awesome there in those backup stories if you've been reading the book but it just it got to a point then it seemed like it jumped back and i got really confused but the first story i actually thought was neat and it was an interesting concept hmm i was prepared to not like that book but i thought it was pretty decent battle pug number one is out this week from image comics this is a very successful web comic that has a compendium of all the previous stuff that's out this week as well there's an ad for it on the back there. This is the start of a new series. Um, I think it's new reader friendly. I've never read the other Battle Pug stuff, and I, I was able to get this. It's basically Conan, and he rides a giant Battle Pug. It's exactly what you think it is. It's a little silly, but it does take itself a little bit seriously. Um, it was fun. It was decent. It wasn't life-changing, game-changing, or anything like that, but it was fun. It was cute, and like I said, it did take itself a little bit serious with its sword and sorcery fantasy at times. All, and then all the time he's riding this dog. It was pretty goofy. It was pretty fun. Sea of Stars number three is here. Jason Aaron, Dennis Hallam, Stephen Green, Rico Renzi. The artwork is fantastic. The story is great. It's about a father who's taking his kid out. He has to go make this run. He has nobody to watch his kid. He's basically a space trucker, if you will, hauling through space. Um, this big creature attacks their ship. Him and his son get separated. His son goes through a wormhole. They get separated by, like, who knows how many light years, right? And it's the story of them separately... And I'm sure eventually their stories will collide again. But it's been very masterful. It's very well done. The pacing of it, going back and forth between the kid and the father, tying in some themes together. The artwork is fantastic. The coloring is so bright, shines. It's brilliant. It just brilliance. It just leaps off the page. It's amazing. I really like it. Sea of Stars number three, continuing the momentum that's been established, not letting up, really fun, great characterizations. And just a fun book with some crazy, imaginative, cr wild fantasy sci-fi ideas. So far. Space Bandits number three is here. Another book that hasn't disappointed me. I'm liking it. Mark Miller, a lot of his books I will typically fall out of by issue three or four. This one's really keeping me in. I'm liking it. It's basically like Thelma and Louise in space in a way. It's about these two women that were completely um, just, just, just ripped off by their previous gangs. Just completely spit on and just you know whatever right now they're getting revenge right and it's fun so they're basically hunting down this woman's old gang who completely screwed her over and they're they're just 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 wreaking vengeance and revenge one at a time and it's fun it's simple but it's fun and it's set in this fan this sci-fi world in space where everybody's kind of obsessed with 80s culture in a way and it's very fun and it's got this it's got that miller-esque tongue-in-cheekiness but it's also very fantastical. It's got some interesting ideas, some really cool ideas, albeit in a Mark Miller type way. But Space Bandits, I loved it. Matteo Scalera's artwork, fire. Loved it so much. Redneck number 23, um, a sad issue, a turning point in the story after the events of last issue. This one kind of deals with the aftermath of that. We're still waiting on other things to happen. Donny Cates has taken this vampire story that I thought initially should have just been a limited series and has stretched it out and built that world out further and more further that I am just so anxiously anticipating each and every issue. Lysandra Estherin's artwork with D. Cuniff on the coloring. I love it. It's raw. It's gritty. It's wrong. It's so perfect, though, and it works so well. Redneck is great. It's about redneck vampires. Get it? It's a funny joke, but this book takes itself very seriously. I've become completely enthralled with these characters and, and invested in their journeys and their lives, and Redneck 23 did not let down. I loved it so much. Big turning points, always, in that issue, or in that in that series. Crowded number nine is here. Christopher Sabella, 
Rose Stein, Ted Brandt, Triona Farrell, Cardinal Ray. I love this book. It's got a great dynamic, fun energy that just goes all the way through and never lets up. It never hits the brakes. It just keeps going. Great characters, instantly compelling, um, a great imaginative concept. Um, I'm loving Crowded right now. If you haven't read Crowded, you definitely should. It's about in the near future. Everything is app driven as we are already getting, right? Privacy is sold out and all that kind of stuff. I love that whole spiel about privacy and, and, and the corporate interest and all that stuff in Crowded number nine. I'm loving this book so much, so much. Sabella is saying so much, but he's also telling a very fun, action-packed story that, that sizzles with humor and just intrigue and mystery and just bouncy fun. So much action, it's dynamic. It really is an action movie all in one. And in the near future, everything's app-driven. You can even crowdfund assassinations. This woman gets crowdfunded, her assassination hits like bill billions of dollars, who knows, right? Just a lot of money, right? Now it's up to her to protect her. Pfft, Crowded's amazing. Crowded's amazing. Plus, Sabella's so cool. If you go check out his website, sometimes you can get cool things from him, like this glow-in-the-dark Crowded Reaper app skull which is super cool. Also, Section Zero wraps up this week with issue number six, and I hope that they, they release the 1959 series very soon, very soon. Of course, I can go to the website and buy it right now. Maybe I will. Carl Kiesel, Tom Grummet. I'm just a fan of that one. So also, Wicked and the Divine, The Wicked and the Divine, number 45 is out. This is the final issue of the series. Um, I can't review it because I didn't read it because I have fallen so far behind on this book. I haven't read it probably in 15 to 18 issues. Yeah, it's been a while. I have them all, though, so I'm looking forward to sitting down and reading this book, but that first half of it was so amazing, and it just completely engaged me, but then I just kind of fell out of it. But that's the final issue, and I'm excited to read it all in one. Everything, number one, is out from Dark Horse Comics this week. Dark Horse has some interesting books out this week. Everything, number one, is the first one I want to talk about. It's got great artwork by I.N.J. Colbard, Christopher Cantwell doing the scripting. Um... The art's probably not going to be for everybody. It's very simple, it's stylized, um, but I love it, and I think it's very effective at this story. This story is basically about this store called Everything, and it opens up in a small town. It's set in, like, 1980, I think. Um, this book, the first issue doesn't let you know everything, and I like that about it, but it definitely gives you the tone of this creepy mystery, what's going on, something is not right at the Everything store, Something's not right about it. So it's speaking on things like consumerism. It's speaking on things like like big corporate corporations like Walmart or something coming in and taking over small businesses, kind of putting them out by, by building in like smaller towns and stuff like that. I'm sure it's saying a lot of stuff about that. But it's also just a really weird, quirky, something slightly off, ice cream man-esque in feeling, esque in feeling, not in like, not in structure or, or content or anything like that. Just, it strikes a chord. It strikes an uneasy chord, and it does it very masterfully. And even though nothing is revealed, really, in this, I am so intrigued about what's going to come. I read this one early, a few, like a month ago, and I thought it was okay. Rereading it tonight, I really captured that tone. Oh, it just worked. It worked for me. I'm just going to say, if you, if you get this and you read it and you don't, you're not into it, set it down for a while, pick it up in one day, a few days from now, read it again and see if it hits you the same way it did. It strikes, it's, it's just, it's unnerving. It's something about it I find very compelling. Triage, number one, is out this week. Um, this one's pretty decent. It's by Philip Seve. Seve? Um, the artwork's pretty cool. It's a neat concept, neat idea. Um, it feels a little static at certain points. But the overall idea of the story is pretty cool. I don't really want to spoil it too much, but basically it's about three versions of the same person having to go on a quest together. And of course, it's crazy. And it's three completely different versions. So like three versions of you, like one from this earth, one from another reality, one from another. And then you, have, you all get pulled out and you have to go on this quest. And nothing's really revealed aside from that, and I kind of did spoil just a little bit of it, but the way that, it's, it's an all right book, it's okay, um, it's an interesting concept, um, the artwork is good, it's got some great weird wild type layouts at times, but in other times it's just kind of run of the mill, okay, average, and then it hits a point, and you're like, oh, that's interesting, and I didn't tell you everything, trust me, um, but Triage number one was an interesting first issue in something, it didn't completely grab me like everything did, but it did 
it did have me interested in where the story's going to go. Berserker Unbound number two is out this week from Jeff Lemire. Mike Diodato Jr. pumping out great artwork. I'm loving it. Great layouts, great composition, um, a great style. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Jeff Lemire doing a great job. It's basically Conan in the modern day. This book is very fun, and it actually says a lot about communication. Um, I really liked it. So in this issue, uh, the Berserker um, stuck in the modern day um, befriends a homeless man, and he kind of goes about him on his day. It's got some fun, lighthearted moments. It's got some serious, real nuanced moments as well. Berserker Unbound number two was fantastic. Not as gritty and violent as the first issue was, but I'm sure there's more of that to come. Um, but a really great issue building up this character and this world that he's been thrust into. No One Left to Fight number three is here. Another exhilarating, highly kinetic energy, energy-filled um, book. It's written by Aubrey Sitterson, um, Fico Osio, and Taylor Esposito, rounding up that creative team, the artist and the letterer, respectively. This book is masterful. It's great. If you love things like Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z especially, if you like fighting games, if you like that kind of stuff, you definitely need to read No One Left to Fight. The artwork is sizzling. It's got great, beautiful colors. It's got slam bang fantastic action. It's very kinetic. It's a highly charged comic book. It's got fast dialogue. It's got fast flow. It's got a great sense of pace to it. It's very, like I said, energetic. You can feel the energy in this book. It's almost like when it sits there on your, on your table, it just starts crackling. This book is so awesome. No One Left to Fight, number three, out this week. And it builds up some more about the characters. Um, interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Weird number four is here, the final issue for now. Um, this has been a series of like neat little one-shot stories about this dude and there's some kind of mystery about him and the government gets him at time from time to time to like take care of things for him it's kind of like a john constantine-esque type character but there's a bigger mystery there nothing gets solved but the way that this ends i definitely cannot wait for book two i'm excited for a book two i hope we're doing a book two because i haven't heard anything about it but it does officially say end of book one anyway kurt pyers antonio fuso They've done a great job with Wired. It's been few and far between. It's been wild. It's been a little bit since the last issue. But it was worth it. It was interesting. And like I said, the way it ends, whoa, super interested. What's going on? Finally, let's talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer number eight. This is the prelude, <coughs> excuse me, to the Hellmouth story that they're building up to, which is the first official crossover between Buffy and Angel in the Boom Studios Buffyverse. Um, it's a reinterpretation of Buffy. Everything is different now completely different. Nothing's going to go the way it did. Though There are allusions to things that have been. A lot's been crammed in. But this was a nice, fun issue that really set up something. It's set on Halloween. I love a good story set on Halloween, especially in the Buffyverse. I'm building up to this big, massive crossover, the Hellmouth opening. We're already getting there? Really? Okay. This is a new and different Buffy, and it's not your dad's Buffy. You know what I'm saying? Because that was my Buffy. Your dad's Buffy was my Buffy. And this isn't. But it's still fun. And I'm having a lot of fun on this, on the familiar characters, but unfamiliar chain of events surrounding them. I'm really liking it, though. Buffy the Vampire Slayer number eight. And I really like that cover. Fantastic. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What you excited about? What you think about it? Let us know in the comments down below. And let's keep the conversation going about comic books in the comments. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more content. Me pointing you in the right direction. What comic books to check out. What we think about movies. And do check out our podcast over at popculturephilosophers.com. We really do appreciate it. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks for rocking with us. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Keep on reading.